I'd like to uh, welcome you out to our uh, lecture this evening. Uh, we are uh, honored and privileged to have with us tonight uh, Morris Fiorina. During the course of his career, Professor Fiorina has published numerous articles and books on national politics, including Retrospective Voting in American National Elections, published by Yale University Press, Divided Government, published by Alan Bacon, and The Personal Vote, published by Harvard University Press, which won the 1988 Richard Fennel uh, Prize. His best-selling book, Culture War, the Myth of a Polarized America was first published in 2004 and has recently been republished in its third edition. He will be signing copies of that book as well as some other of his recent books uh, after the talk today across uh, the hall where we have a reception and a book sign. Professor Fiorina received his BA degree from Allegheny College and his MA and PhD from the University of Rochester. He has been elected to the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences. In addition, he has served on the editorial boards of more than a dozen journals in political science, law, political economy, and public policy. Join me now in welcoming Morris Fiorina. Thank you, Thank you all. Uh, I've never been here before, and the first thing I noticed was this is clearly not a place where uh, bike riders uh, would like to come to, uh, to college. <laughs> yeah. Or else you have very strong legs if you do ride a bike around here. The, um, I'm going to talk today, it's a kind of a three-part talk. First, I'm going to talk about where is the United States coming from, politically speaking. Uh, professors like historical perspective, and it's one of the things that really differentiates us from journalists and pundits. Then I'm going to talk about what happened between the, the um, optimism and, and promise of 2008 and the nastiness and uh, pessimism of 2012. And then briefly finish up with a little bit on the 2012 election uh, and its aftermath, uh, where we're heading from. The uh, undergraduates in the room, uh, most of you were born in the early 1990s, and so probably the first election you really remember is the 2000 election. This was uh, an important election. It was actually the first election since 1952 in which the Republicans won the Triple Crown. Uh, they captured the presidency, the House of Representatives, and the Senate. First time since Eisenhower. They expanded their majorities in Congress in 2002, and they, Bush was re-elected, uh, winning, winning the popular vote this time, and they kept control of Congress in 2004. This six-year period of unified control was the longest period of unified control the country had experienced since the 60s since the Kennedy-Johnson administration of the 1960s. The uh, political scientists call the late 20th century period, this last generation of the 20th century, the era of divided government. During this period, the Republicans were strong at the presidential level. Uh, they won 20 out of, they held the presidency for 20 out of 32 years. The Democrats generally won the Senate 20 out of 32 years. The House was almost invariably Democratic 26 out of 32 years. And the result was, in 26 out of the 32 years, government was divided. A president faced at least one chamber of Congress that was held by the other party. So 2000 to 2006 was an, an unusual period relative to recent history. And at the time, a lot of Democrats began to worry and Republicans began to hope that Karl Rove had succeeded in his announced goal. Uh, for the young people here, Karl Rove was the principal Republican strategist of the Bush administration. And he fancied himself uh, Mark Hanna to William McKinley, the, going back in American history. He didn't just want to re-elect George Bush. He wanted to establish a permanent, or at least as permanent as these things ever are in the United States, a permanent Republican majority. A majority would last for a generation. Uh, well, uh, it didn't work out that way. In 2006, the Republicans took a thumping in George Bush's terms. They lost 30 seats in the House of Representatives and six seats in the Senate, losing control of both institutions, lost six governorships as well. And in 2008, they took another thumping. Uh, John McCain went down uh, in the presidential race, getting less than 46% of the vote. The uh, Republicans lost an additional 24 seats in the House, uh, bringing the two-year total to about, or the two-election total to about 55 lost eight seats in the Senate, giving career control to the Democrats. And in early 2009, uh, James Carville, whom you might, might have seen on CNN, a Democratic uh, commentator, <coughs> published a book called 40 More Years, How the Democrats Will Rule the Next Generation. If you're interested, uh, Amazon will give you 60% off uh, on this book uh, right now. So what happened was in 2010, we had the great shellacking uh, following the great thumping of 2006 and 8. The 
Republicans and the Democrats lost 63 seats in the House and six in the Senate. This was the largest midterm swing since 1938. No American who wasn't born before 1917 could ever have voted in an election where we saw this kind of swing. This was reminiscent of late 19th century uh, occurrences. Seven governorships, 17 chambers of state legislatures, nearly 700 state legislators. We never count New Hampshire because they have so many that, uh, you know, excuse the count. Uh, but, you know, just an all around wipeout. And uh, so then what that gave us was in the space of four elections covering six years, we had four distinct patterns of control. Presidency, unified government in 2004, uh, followed by a Republican head of divided government in 2006, followed by a unified Democratic govern government in 2008, and a Democratic president with a split Congress in 2010. So I, um, there's a couple things that sort of occur to you when you look at this. One is clearly generations are not what they used to be when I was growing up. Uh, there used to be 35 years, now they seem to last for two. Um, the other thing is, I, I wondered how common is this? Uh, in American history, what kind of, this is electoral instability of a, of a major order here. The control of national institutions is shifting back and forth. It turns out we went through the entire 20th century without seeing anything like this. You have to go back to the period 1886 to 1894 where you find five consecutive elections which resulted in five distinct patterns of, uh, of uh, control. As, purely as a political scientist, not as a partisan, I was sort of hoping we'd get another <coughs> one. I was hoping either Romney would win with the Rep Democratic Congress or Obama would win and Congress would, uh, would, would flip-flop so it would tie the all-time record, but we didn't. So as it is, we're in second place in terms of the most recent period in terms of electoral instability occupies second place in American history. Who's to blame? Well, a lot of people, the first thing they do whenever they look at politics is they blame us. They blame voters. And, uh, well, what is it the case? So we're flighty and uncommitted. We think, well, Democrats this time, Republicans this time, you know, shifting back and forth. Uh, are we manic? Republicans are great. No, Democrats are great. We just go flying back and forth. Are we polarized? Uh, well, the answer is really no. Uh, and I, I think the American voter takes a, takes a bad rap here. Now, it is true that the public is very uninterested in politics for the most part. That there's a big gap between the people who are active in politics and the American public. This year, there was a, a lot of attention given to the fact that in the primary debates, people seemed to be really tuned in, that ratings were very high. For example, in the Florida GOP debate, there were 5.4 million uh, viewers. Uh, now, compare that, however, to uh, O'Reilly, uh, which is the highest rated uh, political show on cable TV, 3.6 million. Fox News, uh, 2.7 million. Now, some of my, uh, and uh, Rachel Maddow, 0.4 million. Now, bear in mind, there are 230 million eligible voters in the United States. And so, O'Reilly, uh, you know, gets about 2.5%. Uh, some of my uh, liberal colleagues are apoplectic about Fox News, and I tell them, don't lose any sleep over it. Only about 1% of the potential electorate is watching. Uh, some of my uh, conservative friends would like to see uh, Rachel Maddow tried for treason or at least have her Stanford degree remote, revoked, but in fact she gets about a quarter percent of the visiting the, uh, the audience every day. Every, uh, day. Now compare that with um, American Idol, which averaged 29 uh, million uh, viewers a, a week last year, Dancing with the Stars, 18.4, Two Broke Girls, which I've never seen, but I gather is popular. Um, so the American people just don't follow politics uh, very closely. They're just not that interested. We know from political science research going back to at least the 50s that Americans are in general pretty much uninformed. Uh, they're confused about issues. They are ambivalent. Uh, you know, but that's not a criticism. I mean, uh, you know, I don't blame people for this, that uh, they are confused. I mean, how do we know the, the health care bill? Bills have come up 3,000 pages long, and, and you know, uh, Dodd-Frank, et cetera, et cetera. They're ambivalent. They're pro-choice and they're pro-life. They see both sides. Uh, they're busy people. They're out there raising families, working for a living. You know, you can't, that's why we have representative government. We elect people who actually are supposed to understand and sort of do things. So I don't blame the voters for the way they are. They are not extreme. They are pragmatic. They are not ideological. That people don't walk around saying it's all free markets or it's all government control. They sort of say, well, it depends on the problem and depends on what will work in any given situation. There has been no increase in partisanship, partisan loyalties for about a generation. The Democrats lost their, their national majority or close to majority in the time of troubles in the 1960s. And ever since then, there have been sort of about 35 to 40% of the country 
that says, I'm a Democrat, when we ask this question in surveys. Republicans have never quite made it back to the Eisenhower era. They just generally are around 25% or so of the electorate. The big change is independents, uh, who surged during the uh, 70s, and then have always stayed around 35 to even 40% of the electorate right now. There's, there's a lot of controversy in political science circles about what independents are like, uh, but nevertheless, the fact, I don't know of any argument that would say that people, that independence indicates greater affect for the party system. It has to indicate some degree of alienation or disillusionment with the party system. Uh, just taking a closer look at the independence, you can see what happens with party identification. Um, you've all taken political science, right? You know what I mean by party identification and so forth? Okay. Um, you know, 2008, people were feeling good about the Democrats. So, you know, the Democrats go up a little. In 2010, they're feeling good about the Republicans, so Republicans go up a little. Uh, the trend in more recent years has been just sort of like pretty much stability here. That, that basically the partisan loyalties of the country haven't changed in about a generation. The uh, maps we see, this doesn't come out very well, but the classic red-blue map, uh, it reifies partisan divisions. It makes everything look either bright red or bright blue. Uh, the fact of the matter is because there are so many independents, because there are so many people who are fairly weakly attached to the parties, that make, creates, it makes the divisions look bigger than they are. This is a map, and again, it doesn't come out real well. If you shade areas by how Democratic and how Republican they are, how strong, how many independents, you get a much more nuanced picture. And there are, in fact, deep blue places like the Upper Northeast and some deep red places like the South, parts of the South. College towns tend to be blue. San Francisco, where I'm from, is blue. But by and large, there's a lot of pink and a lot of purple, which really reflects the fact that Americans aren't that polarized in a partisan sense. There's a little change in voter ideology. The uh, General Social Survey at the University of Chicago has been asking this question since the 70s. Uh, liberal is always the least popular, it just is the term in American politics. Usually 25 or 30 percent say I'm a liberal. Conservative is 30, 35 percent, and again moderate, people like the middle, it's around 35, 40 percent. Very little change. The American electorate looks pretty much the same as it did in the 70s. How about individual issues? Well, the Pew Foundation has been asking a series of 48 questions since 1987. They go out every couple of years. And just all manner of things about values, attitudes, policies, etc. So again, no change. Basically, since the Reagan era, the country looks pretty much the same. That things that were contested then are contested now. Things that weren't contested then aren't contested now. Basically, there's just a whole lot of stability in American public opinion when you drill down to all the individual issues. Now, there's a lot of confusion in the United States. There are a lot of people who think we're polarized. And the reason is because people confuse what I call sorting with polarization. And so let me just explain the difference here. The, uh, this is polarization. Polarization is the middle disappears. So at time one, for example, we have a Democratic Party, which is somewhat left of center, a Republican Party, somewhat right of center, and 100 moderates. At time two, the moderates are gone. Everybody's gone to the extremes. They're either liberals or they're, either con or they're conservatives. So that's polarization. Here's what sorting is. At time one, again, we have it as in the previous slide. And in time two, we still have the same number of liberals, the same number of conservatives, 100 of each, the same number of moderates, 100. But they're better sorted. The Democratic Party is now clearly a liberal party. The Republican Party is clearly a conservative party, even though the, the distributions haven't changed. And that's what's happened in the United States. That there used to be a lot of Northeastern Republicans who were, in many cases, more liberal than a lot of the Democrats in the area. They are gone. There used to be a lot of Southern conservative Democrats who were more conservative than many of the Republicans. They are gone. That basically what's happened is we now have two parties which are much more clearly sorted than they were a generation or so ago. Now, Congress has polarized and sorted. And the, the point I want to make here is the political class the people who run for office, who serve in office, who donate money, who work in campaigns, who work in the interest groups, call them the political class. They are polarized. The middle has disappeared for them. They are polarized. Speaker Foley went to Congress in the early 60s. And this is what Congress looked like back when he entered Congress. The Democrats, th these are um, political scientists, uh, scale roll call votes and put people along the liberal conservative dimension. And Democrats are outlined in blue. Republicans are outlined in red. That's what it looked like in the latter day, the early days of the Kennedy administration. This is what it looks like today. All recent Congresses are like this. And you can see three things. First, both parties have become more homogeneous. The, the, the Democrats are more cohesively on the left, Republicans more on the right. 
Uh, second, their center of gravity has moved outward. Democrats are now more liberal than they were. Republicans are more conservative than they were. And as a consequence, the overlap has just all but disappeared. These are areas here where you have Republicans in Democratic territory and Democrats in Republican territory. No more. In some recent Congresses, there is no uh, Democrat to the left. To the, get this right. No Democrat to the right of any Republican, or no Republican to the left of any Democrat. There's perfect separation between the parties. So there just just isn't this moderate caucus in there anymore. Now this is no doubt exaggerated because some of them might be really more moderate in their heads, but party discipline makes them keeps them from actually expressing it. But nevertheless, all the data we have on the political class indicates polarization. John Aldrich has, has pieced together this diagram on both party activists and donors over the years. This is the difference, how different they are on a liberal conservative scale, seven points from extremely liberal to extremely conservative. As you can see, in 1972, these are the activists. They start out just about a unit apart, slightly left of center, slightly right of center, and it just goes up and up and up until they're two and a half or more units apart. Donors start out more polarized and go up in a straight line like that. There are studies of party chairs, in, you know, county party chairs, convention delegates, et cetera, all show the same thing, that Republicans and Democrats at the upper levels of involvement are polarized, but that polarization doesn't uh, penetrate far down into the electorate. The uh, Pew Foundation actually does point out that Democrats and Republicans in the electorate are more farther apart now than they used to be. They used to be nine or 10 points apart when they began their studies 25 years ago. Now they're 18. Now if you take your research methods class, we always teach people, don't graph things to exaggerate uh, differences. If you consider the fact that the average Republican and Democrat in the population could be 100 points apart, uh, you use a scale like this, and that's the difference between Democrats and Republicans today. Same data, just <coughs> plotted on a different scale. They've gone over the course of 25 years from an average of 10 points apart to an average of 18 points apart, which is a party sorting. That the parties are more homogeneous, but not nearly as much as the activists. And just to really, you know, bring this point home, and maybe I'm overkilling it, uh, take an issue that defines the party elites, like abortion. Now, what, what, think about the conventions we just had. The Democratic platform said basically, any time for any reason. The Republican platform said basically, never, for, never at, at no time, never for any reason. So they were about as far apart as you could get. Now, what we're going to uh, contrast here is not just Democrats and Republican voters, but strong Democrats, who are about 20% of the population, and strong Republicans. And how do they feel about the abortion issue, where the party elites are Wide, widely separated. Well, the question we use, and by the way, this lecture is about one month too early. We'll have 2012 data from the ANES uh, coming up in about a month, but this is still the uh, last one. The ANES question on abortion is, uh, gives people four options. You don't want to try to divide people into pro-choice, pro-life. They have different definitions and so forth. So these are, the, these are the ideas. Now, there's a big, you know, a huge partisan difference. But would you ever have thought that one out of 10 strong Democrats in the population says abortion should never be allowed? Or that two out of 10 say only in the most severe cases of rape, incest, or women's life in danger? That essentially here, more than a quarter of the strong Democrats are closer to Mitt Romney's position on abortion than they are to their own party. And on the Republican side, it's even more striking. Uh, two out of every 10 strong Republicans says always. They are pro-choice, period. And another you know, 16%, one out of eight, says well, for a clear need. So arguably, 35% more than a third are closer to the Democratic position on abortion. So that's how poorly sorted even the strongest partisans are in the electorate. Then when you add in the not so strong Democrats and Republicans, then we have here more than, uh, essentially more than a majority of not so strong Democrats, uh, let's see, it's this one, 42% uh, uh, are fairly conservative on this issue. And 60% of the not so strong Republicans are liberal on this issue. So, so you can't tell where people stand by watching the shouters on TV, the speech makers on TV, the commentators on TV, because they are by definition abnormal. That normal Americans are much more moderate, much more basically, I think, tolerant, uh, much more willing to see both sides to consider different alternatives than the people who run for office. The, the party elites, however, are really important because they are the public face of politics in America, and they're the ones who create our politics, and who, in my view, uh, bring on some of the negative consequences. You may remember the Republican uh, primary uh, elections, or if you're a Republican, you may not want to remember <coughs> the Republican primaries uh, this, this spring. But these are the turnout rates. Remember, it was Kane, Palin, Trump.
Trump, you know, just the, the candidate of the week. These are the turnout rates of eligible voters in these early contests. Those are real. The night that Rick Santorum was declared by the national media to be the contender, to be the alternative to Mitt Romney, that was on the basis of winning three contests. One out of two, one out of 100 eligible voters in Minnesota turned out. Two out of 100 eligible voters in Colorado turned out. And seven out of 100 eligible voters in Missouri turned out. So as, you know, as abnormal as these people are, as unrepresentative as they are, they are nevertheless very important. Political scientists refer to these kind of people as the wingnuts of the two parties. That they're the people who are most active, who, who are the images of the party, and they are obviously important, but they don't represent the American public. Partly because I think we have this, the, the people driving politics, uh, our presidents recently have tended to overshoot. And by overshooting, it's not a normative term. Basically think of it this way. The Democrats start building their coalition on the left, and they've got to get enough of the center to win. Republicans start building their coalition on the right, they've got to get enough center to win. Overshooting means, or overreaching, means you govern in a way that you lose the center. That, and often I think the base pulls these people too far to one side. So when George Bush was reelected in 2004, on a basis of a not terribly uh, big margin, he announced in his, uh, he announced that he had earned capital in the campaign, political capital, and now I intend to spend it. And he announced in his inaugural address that uh, we were going to have a freedom agenda, that we are spread democracy throughout the world, that we're going to per have personal uh, Social Security accounts. And a whole lot of American voters looked at each other and thought, gee, I don't remember voting for any of that. Uh, and in fact, in his memoirs, published in 2010, he says, well, on reflection, uh, maybe I misread things. Uh, maybe that wasn't what I had a mandate for. And Obama, I think, fell prey to the same thing. Uh, you might remember this speech. Let's forget about healing the planet and everything and slowing the rise of the oceans. That's a high bar. You know, you can't make that bar. You know, let's promise some reasonable stuff. And in fact, what happened, um, Obama had a good win. I mean, you can't blame him for thinking that maybe there was a real mandate to do some stuff there. Uh, these are the elections in American history when one party has replaced the other party. And there's a couple of monsters up here, you know, like Roosevelt. But basically, Obama's up there pretty well, a little behind Reagan, uh, Margin, uh, Eisenhower here. And so it's an impressive presidential victory. He switched three states, uh, three in the west here, Nevada and these two, and three in the Midwest and three in the south. And so it, it looked like he really scrambled the electoral map. And I think the Democrats thought, really, this was a new year. I don't think Carville was sort of completely bonkers when he, uh, when he published that book. But the fact of the matter is, um, then they, they come under the great shellacking, 63 seats, two years later. And I think the economy obviously had a lot to do with that. And this is a complicated graph, but it really conveys a lot of information. These are maps of the American recessions that have occurred since World War II. And what the, uh, what the constructor did, uh, this website here, Calculated Risk, they set the maximum employment prior to the onset of the recession at zero. So that's the, that's the maximum employment. Then they plot over months of the year, or total months, how many jobs are lost, percentage of jobs are lost. So this is 1948 recession right here, the bad post-war recession. And as you can see, over the course of about a year, we lost a little over 5% of the jobs in the country. Then we hit bottom, and we started out. So this is the classic V-shaped re recession you, were, you read about. These are all roughly V-shaped. And they tend to be pretty, pretty short. They're sort of two years, two and a half years. Is how. Now, the two big exceptions to that are, one, this is the dot-com bubble. That it's fairly shallow. We only lost 2% of the job, but it went on a long time. It went on nearly four years. This is where we are now. This really is the worst job market since the Great Depression. Our, you know, basically, my generation and my kids' generation never saw that. You, you people now are walking out into the worst job market since the Great Depression. There's no sign of it coming back. I mean, this is if we don't go into a double dip. We're going to be six, eight years out here before it comes back. So if you're in computer science or electrical engineering, the world is your oyster. But if you're in um, comparative literature or gender studies or even political science, well, good luck. You know, it's a tough, uh, tough world out there. So obviously this economy did have a lot to do, and we, we have models that predict congressional seat loss, and those models basically predicted a, a, a loss much smaller. The economy alone, these losses were about 50% greater than, than our seat models predicted. And uh, I think a lot of it uh, is that the Democrats, as I said, overreached. But this is basically the story of the 2008 election. Uh, it wasn't a mandate to do anything in particular except not do what George Bush had done. These are Bush's approval ratings. You can see if you're in business and these are your sales or your revenue chart, you've got a problem. 
And this is it, the whole way down until at the end, Bush is in Truman and Nixon levels, historical lows. And when Obama was elected, there's a lot of uncertainty about who he is. Now, a lot of Democrats thought maybe he's a left-wing ideologue, and Republicans thought he was, and maybe even a socialist. Uh, or they feared, the, Democrat, the people on the left feared, maybe he's just a pragmatist, just a ruthless Chicago politician. And people in the center probably thought, we hope that's what he is, that he's sort of somewhere in the middle. And you can see in this graph from Gallup data how uncertain people were. That you think that Obama has pursued as president have been mostly liberal, mostly moderate, or mostly conservative. And you can see here that at the beginning, when Obama is, sworn, is, uh, is elected, people are evenly divided. About 45% think, well, he's a moderate. About 45% think he's a liberal. For some reason, there's 10% that think he's a conservative. Now, I, maybe these are San Francisco Democrats, and he is conservative relative to what they, uh, what they are. Or maybe it's just these are, who knows. But anyway, you can see what happens over time. As the Democrats in Congress begin to pursue their agenda, people more and more say, whoops, we elected a liberal. And by September, you know, there's a big gap already opening up. We did an article, several colleagues and I, on the electoral cost uh, to the Democrats of the health care legislation. This is just, uh, if you've never seen these pollster graphs, what they do is they take individual polls, those are all the dots, and then they run the central tendency line through them. And you can see health care never enjoyed majority support. As soon as people began to find out about it, they went into opposition from ignorance. And, so, and that continues to today. And yet this is what the Democrats, this and cap and trade, the House of Representatives in particular, staked the whole first year, year and a half on. And we concluded, uh, we tortured the data in innumerable ways, and we concluded that the vote on health care uh, was essentially the difference between survival and, and defeat for the Democratic, uh, Democrats who went down in 2010. That uh, if Obama won your vote, your, if your district was tied, Obama and McCain basically tied, then whether you voted yay on health care or nay on health care, was the difference. You either went down or you survived. If Obama lost your district, you might barely survive if you voted no. You were a goner if you voted yay. If Obama won your district, it was still a really close call if you voted yay. You might squeak through. And we concluded that ba cap and trade has a similar effect, that the votes were so closely aligned that it's hard to get a statistical difference between them. But we concluded basically that if you could run another world where the Democrats never brought up health care, they might have just barely hung on to their majority in 2010, barely. Uh, or it could have been one or two seats the other way. So I don't think it was purely a matter of, of the, the, the policies being too liberal, although admittedly the Republicans did a good job of demonizing it, talking about death panels and so forth. But it's a question of priorities. It's, it's, it's the, uh, the fact that Americans are dying out there. They're losing their homes, they don't have jobs, and these people are doing cap and trade, which is actually going to make energy prices go higher. They're doing health care. They're not doing jobs. It's sort of like they're out of touch. They're pursuing an ideological agenda as opposed to the problems that Americans really wanted them to be working on. And those, you know, those two slides are slight exaggerations. But if you look at when the House was considering health care in July of 2009, when the Senate was doing it after the Scott Brown election in January 10, people were saying, what's the most important problem? Jobs, economic growth, getting worried about spending. Health care is a distant third on these issues, that the government is just sort of in its own, you know, spinning in its own uh, different sphere from other people. And what happens is Obama loses the middle. That the, this is approval of independence among independents at the start of his term. This is disapproval. And you can see by a fall, after they've been pursuing this sort of everything but what people want them to be working on, independence, he's underwater. And independents now disapprove of him. And it just continues uh, that way until the 2012 election when independents swing massively. Above the line, independents are voting for Republicans. Uh, 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 yes, it's this percent Republican minus percent Democratic. Below the line, they're voting for Democrats. And you can see here the 17-point swing against the Republicans in 2006, followed by an 18-point swing toward the Republicans in 2010. I've never seen swings this big by any group. You can divide the electorate in all kinds of groups to see this kind of massive turn away. And you can see independents really have a lot to do with when Reagan comes in and does big gains in Congress, that's independence. When uh, Newt Gingrich, when Speaker Foley gets turned out in 1994, big Republican <coughs> gains among independents. Uh, Obama comes in, Democrats, uh, we'll show you that slide in a minute. But anyway, you lose the center. The 12 to 12 elections, uh, Obama wins by a narrower margin, down four and a half points from his previous margin. 
to the everlasting embarrassment of the Republicans, the Democrats actually pick up two seats, but are only, they're defending two-thirds of the ones that are out there. The House Democrats pick up eight more, and governors, Republicans won. So it's a bitter disappointment for the Republicans. They think they have the Democrats on the, on the ropes, and they don't do it. And again, just to focus on independence, um, you can see here Bush gets them in 2000, nearly loses them in 2004, Obama gets them in 2008. Um, Republicans, the independents actually went slightly Republican in 2012, but the Democratic turnout operation uh, overcame that. So it's, it's the, the flux here created by independents is giving us this instability. And the, the big story, if you've been reading, that comes out of the last election is a demographic story. That the Republicans really hoped that 2012 would look more like 2004 in terms of about 75% white, that, um, uh, or 2008 that the Obama would not be able to replicate their, their turnout operation on African Americans, Latinos, et cetera. Uh, but they did, they were very effective. And the story you keep hearing now is that basically uh, Latinos, uh, blacks, et cetera, were heading into the majority minority uh, electorate over the years. And there is something to that, but I think it lets the Republicans off too easy. Uh, it's, you know, it just lets them say, well, I'm sorry, we've just alienated certain groups and it's sort of the demographics are against us. If you look at not the percentages, but the numbers, you get another uh, interesting uh, feature here. First of all, with six million more Americans eligible to vote, turnout actually declined by three million over this period. Obama's vote went down by four million, Rom McCain Romney went up by one. So about three million fewer voters on top of six million more voters, so it's a significant decline. As I said, the, the, the exit poll numbers are soft, but it looks like a couple hundred thousand more African Americans voted looks like somewhere close to two million more Latinos voted. But given that you're talking here about like 2.4 million people and you've lost, um, you've lost three million, about five million fewer whites appear to have voted. So uh, whatever the Republicans were selling did not even appeal that much to whites. They got a high percentage of the white vote, but a whole lot of whites didn't turn out. And so I think they need to look very carefully at what they're selling out there. And the, uh, the problems are pretty obvious. Uh, first is, you've been reading, they're the party of white people, uh, that they, they depend very heavily on whites and have done very poorly among minorities in recent elections. And not, actually, not all that recent. I mean, George Bush got about 40% of the Latino vote, but that was an exception. Now, in each case, the Democrats have to worry about going too far. You know, it's, it's one of these things I, I emphasize about staying to the center. Like, the Democrats can't become just the party of minorities because it, you know, it gets too much that way, there's still a large number of whites in the country. And so in the, in the 1970s, most people who, who have been around a long time like I have sort of see in the Republicans today a lot of what happened to the Democrats in the 70s, when they just sort of got kicked out of the mainstream of American politics and took them a long time to come back. The um, immigration, everybody agrees we're gonna do something about it now. Uh, this is a question that gives two polar opposites at zero and 10. This is essentially amnesty. And this is essentially round them up and ship them home. And people say, well, the Republicans are pretty close to that edge, and the Democrats are pretty close to the liberal edge, and they're, of course, right in the middle. Uh, so the question is, how can Republicans and Democrats come together and reach a compromise acceptable to them and to the American people? The second Republican problem uh, is they're the party of the rich. Uh, the, uh, if I were a Republican strategist right now, I'd be saying, break up the banks. I'd say you want a winning economic issue, break up the banks. That you have to learn there's a distinction between crony capitalism and free enterprise. And what we have now is crony capitalism. Here we have a Democratic administration in, in Washington, and Tim Geithner on the Fed pays back Goldman Sachs 100 pennies on the dollar when AIG goes down. Then he commits, in my opinion, obstruction of justice in the HSBS case by quashing criminal, or criminal indictments. And that's a Democratic administration. Now, the Republicans ought to be able to go after that. But they sort of seem blind at the idea that all business is good, whether it's actually you know, free enterprise or not. They seem blind to that. But I think that would be the way to get out of it. Now, the, the Democrats, the problem here is you don't want to be seen as the party of the dependents. Now, Romney obviously made a terribly impolitic <coughs> remark about his 47%. But the American people still have a very strong work ethic. They're not really comfortable with social welfare programs of all kinds. Um, the, um, I mean, the, the Democrats, again, have to, the, the things that Clinton emphasized, I think, still have a lot of resonance. Bill Clinton, by the way, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton's husband from the 90s. They still have a lot of resonance in the, uh, in the American electorate. And uh, a third problem is, I, I think it's becoming, I mean, it's so obvious to you when you live in a place like California. Uh, I live among tens of thousands of affluent, young, educated professionals 
who go out every election and vote for people who are going to raise their taxes. And the, the reason is the alternative is to vote for a bunch of a party whose platform is, well, let's log the redwoods and bash gays and, uh, and ban abortion. You know, and so, I mean, it, it, the, it, it's true that the turn towards social conservatism won the Republicans the South. They probably couldn't have taken Congress without that. But it's really endangering them, I think, as a presidential party because there's so much of the sort of the coastal states that simply will not vote for a Republican party that's branded in that way. And we're seeing, I think, a really shockingly fast turnaround on some of these issues now. I mean, it's just you wake up every day and something's happening. This is very recent data from the Pew Foundation. 2001, this is after Clinton, uh, there's a t close to a 20% majority, uh, yeah, 20% opposed to gay marriage. 2004, when the Republicans make this a particular issue, it actually gets widened, and then it starts down. And it really accelerates after Obama's elected. Until now, there is a plurality in favor of uh, gay marriage. We pointed out in the book Culture War that although some of this is growing tolerance among people, most of it is generational. I mean, you can see here old people, well, okay, sorry, senior citizens, uh, some of whom are very good friends of mine, they, go, they get more tolerant over time, as do baby boomers. But the big difference is generations. That let's start out here, 21% of, uh, well, I can't start here because no, millennials, 51% in favor, seniors, 18%. And here by the end, 63, 33, 30 points different. And the point is, these people are dying. These people are coming into the electorate. So the long-term trend, barring some, something we cannot foresee, is that people are getting more and more liberal on this issue. So it's an absolute loser uh, for Republicans. They can also uh, look at this data and see independents are way, way more close to Democrats on this issue than they are to Republicans. Republicans are really out of step. And moderates, of course, in the middle, but nevertheless closer to the Democrats on the issue than, than the Republicans. And so, I, you know, I mean, I think I, I, we're seeing a party try to reposition itself at a pace, at a, a schedule that I've really never seen before. And it's gonna cause tremendous internal tensions within the party because these social conservatives will not go easily. Although in the younger generation of social conservatives, sociologists claim that there is an attempt to de-emphasize what we call below the belt issues in favor of human rights, poverty, third world disease and so forth, and go more towards civil society to deal with some of the issues like abortion, gay, gay, gay rights and so forth that have been, uh, been politicized. Democrats have a problem too, which is their domestic agenda, uh, which because um, is simply more liberal than the country as a whole. And this is a really great graph that shows their problem. This is the country, all the congressional districts in the country, where you have blue crosses blue pushpins rather. Those are the locations, the districts of the Democratic committee chairs in 2010 when they're doing health care, et cetera. You can see where they are. They're in Washington, I well, no, Washington, you know, the East Coast, the, sort of the Massachusetts down to Maryland, and they're in California. And the red crosses are Pelosi, Hoyer, the leadership, and the three committees that dealt with the health care bill specifically. And you see there San Francisco, and somewhere up here in Massachusetts, Connecticut, yeah. And so the agenda is being set by sort of people who are in the north, the cosmopolitan northeast in California. All those little yellow bubbles here, those are the McCain Democrats. Those are the Democrats who were elected in 2006 and 8 from districts that were won by John McCain in 2008. So their districts went Republican, but they were elected as Democrats. See where they are? They start up here in Pennsylvania, where I w grew up, where the people cling to their God and guns. And they come down Appalachians, across the south, a few up in Missouri here, up the mountains. Very different, different place. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and these are the majority. For the Democrats to have a majority in Congress, they need these kind of people to win. They can't win just in the Northeast and just in California and just in a few university towns around the country. They have to have these kind of people. But the problem is you have an agenda which is set by the liberal wing of the party, the leadership of the party, and it puts these people in jeopardy. And it really did in 2010. Just to go back to those, the 2010 election, 49 Democratic incumbents lost, that's a lot. Pretty much lost most of the people they brought in in 2006, especially 2008. They lost 21 of the 24 people whom Obama brought in in 2008. And if you look at the Democratic incumbents in the McCain districts, 28 of them lost. 
and they lost because of health care and cap and trade. If they voted no on both those bills, if they, they jumped ship and told Nancy Pelosi no, eight out of 15 of them made it through the election. If they voted yes on either one, 13 out of 16 went down. If they voted yes on both, they were dead meat. You know, it's just that, that's what those votes, those policies, you know, put these guys at risk and, and killed the Democratic majority in Congress. So the Democrats have to figure out how to have an agenda that doesn't keep them from winning a majority in the House, which, which it does at the moment. And they're still having problems with this. This is a very recent poll, January. And again, it's a, the question wording here was, what do you think should be the top priorities of Congress and the President to work on in the coming year? Now think back a little bit. After Obama was reelected, what did he say we're going to do? What are we going to concentrate on? He said, okay, we're going to concentrate on immigration, right? We're going to concentrate on climate change, right? We're going to concentrate on guns, yeah, right? Okay. We heard all those things. All right, what are American people, and he, and he sort of said the same thing in his inauguration speech, what are the American people, the top priorities? Now well, there's the economy again, jobs, deficit, terrorism, social security. What are all those issues that the Democrats were supposed to work on? Well, there's immigration coming in at number 17. There's guns coming in at 30, uh, number 18. This is a month after the Connecticut, Connecticut massacre. This is, gun laws is number 18 out of 21 priorities a month after the massacre in Connecticut. And global warning comes in 21 out of 21. So again, the, the tendency, the things that the Democrats would like to work on are far, far from the priorities of the American public. And so the, the point will be how do, they, how do they sort of harness their members and fortunately, <laughs> in a way fortunate for them, the Republican House will keep them from doing any of these things. But I mean, the point is how do you avoid putting your marginal members in, in uh, danger? How do you let Democrats in those McCain type districts, Romney type districts, win office to give you a majority? Looking ahead. Democrats need 17 House seats to win uh, control of the House. Could be done. Uh, only one election since the Civil War has, in a second term of a president, have they gained seats. There have been three totally in, in the midterms, but in the, in the second election, so that's an uphill uh, battle. Uh, Republicans need six Senate seats, and again, just pointing out where some of these are, where some of these are located, uh, Louisiana, South Dakota, these are seats that uh, are considered to be possible competitive seats. A lot of these, the Democratic agenda could be very harmful. Louisiana, South Dakota, Arkansas, Alaska, Arkansas. You don't want to talk about guns. And so, I mean, to, to make these senators vote on issues like that could be potentially very harmful uh, for people in this area. Uh, 2016, I'm not going to say anything about. And, and the reason is really, here's, here's the reason. You can speculate all you want to about Rubio and Cruz and uh, um, Hillary and uh, who else, Cuomo, et cetera. In 1974, after the election, Gallup decided it was time to start thinking about their trial heats for 1976. And uh, you know, the head-to-head, -head, you know, if the election were held today, would you vote for Gerald Ford or whoever? And on the Republican side, it's pretty easy. It was going to be uh, Ford or Reagan. Democrats, you know, who's going to be? They've just been wiped out in two elections. So they went around, talked to all the Democratic officials, and they came up with a list of 34 names of potential Democratic candidates for 1976. One name that was not among the 34 was Jimmy Carter. So at this point, I just won't even indulge in speculation about what are these people's chances are. It's just way too far ahead. Politics is uncertain. And uh, it's a fun parlor game, but who knows. And I want to conclude by coming back to this, uh, this electoral instability uh, we've talked about here that uh, in the last five elections, we've seen four distinct patterns. And when I went back to that period in American history that's even more unstable than this, 1886 to 1894, I realized that there were a lot of similarities. That it's a period that's referred to by historians as the era of no decision. And it, it comes from the fact that the politics was chaotic during, this, during the period from the time they, basically the South came back into the Union to uh, the election of McKinley in 1896 we had almost nothing but divided government. That, uh, let's see, the Republicans had it in 1888, although the president lost the, electoral, lost the uh, popular vote and won the Electoral College there. They had it in 1880, although the Senate was tied, actually, in that race. The Democrats had won, and they probably lost it in the Depression of the early 90s. Everything else was divided government. Everything else was just, you're in, you're out, majorities are coming back and forth. And it turns out uh, it was a highly polarized era, as our Congress is now, that these are polarization scores from that period. 
gets much less polarized in the 20th century and then heads back up again uh, late century. And the similarities are things like these. Uh, it was an era of globalization. That British finance was going throughout the world. They were building our railroads, investing in our industries. Uh, we all, globalization is obviously a buzzword now. Uh, it was an era of economic transformation. Then it was from agriculture to an industrial economy, uh, whereas today it's been more from a, a post-industrial communications, uh, whatever you want, want to call it. A uh, period of internal population movements. Um, then it was farms to cities. People were deserting the farms and just building up the cities. Today, of course, it's been more in the last generation from the Frost Belt to the Sun Belt uh, in the country and to the West. It was an era of mass immigration. Uh, immigration was even uh, more common uh, then uh, as a percentage of the population. It was a much larger percentage of the population than today. And it was a period of rising economic inequality, the Gilded Age. And of course, we're in a period like that now. That a lot of the social and economic forces at work really have sort of echoes in, in today's uh, uh, system. And the, the point is that these kinds of problems, they, social changes and developments, they create political problems. They create new problems the parties have to deal with. Uh, they threaten to overturn old coalitions, and they give all political entrepreneurs the chance to construct new coalitions. So they sort of create the kind of chaos, the ferment. The problem is that uh, this was a period, again, you know, we could, we could take this kind of uh, chaos, that Britannia still ruled the waves. Uh, they could handle foreign affairs, and we could free ride uh, on them. Um, the big economic issue, believe it or not, was how to do away with the surplus that we were pulling in too much money to spend. And so the question was, how do we get rid of it? You know, whereas today, people were worried, obviously, about uh, debt, uh, the debt crisis. Um, and so, uh, you know, basically, we, we sort of muddled through 20-some years of chaos. And then finally, the Republicans put together a national majority in 1896, which held to the New Deal, except for Woodrow Wilson. Uh, can we do that today? I mean, there was terrorism then, but they didn't have weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we have, the, as they say, the debt problem that I'm just not sure we can tolerate uh, how much more of this. And so I'm going to enjoy, I'll leave you on a down note that I've, this is my 40th year as a professor. And I'm temperamentally optimistic and I uh, have great faith in the American people, not their leaders, but great faith in the American people. But I've never been more concerned about what lies ahead than I am right now. Thank you. You make a lot of the fact that there's polarization that's taking place at the elite, primarily the party story, but not so much at the mass public. Um, did you read Jamie Jockman's piece in the capsule? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you make of his argument that, in fact, uh, polarization at the elite level is actually affecting the way individual Americans evaluate policy yeah. proposals? There, it's, it's, um, there's conflicting data. I mean, there are some studies which suggest that, in, depending on what, what you do with experiments, or whether you're doing observational data, that basically this is going to percolate down, that, that sort of eventually that population will follow. And there are other studies which suggest that's not the case. And so I think, I mean, it's a concern. I mean, <laughs> if, if he's right and those findings generalize that I'm concerned. But there's enough other data that I'm sort of a little more optimistic. And, and one of the things that's sort of encouraging is there are several studies Remember, Cass Sunstein had this, uh, this argument that people are cocooning themselves off into uh, sort of private bubbles, basically, where liberals only go to liberal websites, conservatives only go to conservative websites, and nobody talks. The studies that have looked at where people actually go on the web show a very different picture that most people who go to, first of all, a lot of people don't go to any political sites at all, most people. They're not interested in that. But the people who do tend to be just junkies. They tend to go to all of them. They follow the, 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 the there is no evidence that the internet is segregating people. In fact, there's a couple of guys here in Chicago who uh, did a similar analysis with the internet sites and things like the New York Times, Washington Post, and they concluded that the mainstream media is actually more segregated in terms of its audience than the internet is. Go back there. With your um, uncertainty with the next couple of years and with party affiliation even in a way like that states identifying themselves from others, do you think secession will ever be spoken of again? No, I don't think so. I think Texans say crazy things and uh, they enjoy their reputation, but uh, I, it's hard to imagine. I mean, but basically, if you look at the actual voters in the states, uh, even if the politicians talk this way sometimes, the average voters say that's just bonkers. You know, that don't, you know, nobody takes that seriously. One of the examples that you used to show, you know, publics are not polarized was on abortion. And as you, you know, people say that it is not that important for them. 
So if you ask them, you know, when it comes to the important issues like economy or jobs, so which part is more capable of you know, dealing with this issue? Mm -hmm. And then are you going to see you know, party polarization in the public as well? Yeah. Um, one of the things that's happened is um, it was actually, this, this was a poll reported in USA Today where they would give people a policy and ask them what they thought of it. And then they give the other half the sample, say this is the Republican policy, this is the Democratic policy. And in the first treatment, people would say, oh, that's good, sounds good, you know, just sort of like, and when immediately you put a tag on it, then suddenly it became, Democrats said, no, that's bad, it was a Republican tag, and vice versa. Now, and, and they were saying how negative it was, I thought that's actually positive, because what it suggests to me is if the Republicans and Democrats would both come together on something, everybody would be willing to do it, that, that people say, as long as my party signed on to it, it's okay. Uh, but yeah, we've reached a state, state in terms of the mistrust among partisans, um, that among the strongest partisans especially, that uh, just tagging something with the name uh, gives, you a, you know, gives you a very different opinion on it. So we need leadership. We need people to come together, Republicans and Democrats, and say, this is what we ought to do. And then I think the country will say, okay, if you both agree that's what we ought to do, we'll do it. Even, th even controversial issues like abortion, and I'm not abortion, but uh, immigration. Uh, what do you make about the contrasting trends where it seems like the American public on the abstract level uh, is more conservative, both in their ideology and saying they don't favor government spending, but when asked about specific policies, you get large majorities who favor more spending on Social Security, health care, education, etc. There's a very good new book on this uh, by James Stimson and Christopher Ellis. And the, the, what the question is referring to here is 40% of Americans say, I'm a conservative, when they choose between conservatives and liberals. But if you ask people questions on Social Security, government regulation, you get much, more, much higher liberal responses. And uh, this has been known since the 1930s. The, the argument was people are philosophically conservative and operationally liberal. Well, what Stimson and Ellis did was comb through the public opinion data and they, what they found was very interesting. Liberals really are liberal. If, you ask, if somebody says, I'm a liberal, they're down the line for liberal policies. You have a bit of a rump who are socially conservative, but sort of, sort of the old New Deal type liberal. Conservatives are all over the map. That the, the percentage of people who are both socially and economically conservative is, I believe, under 30%. There are a lot of, and the libertarians who are economically conservative and socially liberal are under 10%. There's a, two big groups of people who call themselves conservatives who don't have conservative policy preferences. And one group is, is um, basically religious people who they, they don't have much, I mean, I, I can't do justice, full justice to their argument, but who sort of ha have the label because they're traditionalists. And they, they sort of the, the, the liberal label just has more negative connotations than or, or their conservative label. And the other group is sort of clueless people that they just sort of, you know, and I've often felt it's TV that if you see Often liberals who show up on TV, especially when I was younger, they're protesters, they're feminists, they're minorities, they're guys with ponytails and gray hair, you know. Whereas conservatives appear on TV, they're military people, they're people in suits, they sort of like look like sort of upstanding middle Americans. And I think a lot of people who don't know anything about politics just sort of say, well, they look like me. And so, but I mean, it's so the, the you often hear Republicans say, this is a center-right country. Look at all these people who say they're conservatives. But if you actually look at the issue positions they hold, it's not nearly as solid as that. A lot of these people will vote for uh, economically liberal and other liberal positions. Yeah. Obviously, people around Obama and Obama himself, let's look at those Pew results. Why are they not doing jobs, jobs, jobs? That's what we stand for, that's what we mean, that's who we are. Well, what was interesting was uh, if you looked at the, uh, about three days before the inauguration, the uh, State of the Union speech, they suddenly pivoted to jobs. And I remember saying to a colleague, somebody read the Pew poll, because up, up to that time it had been all immigration, guns, gay rights, climate change, and then suddenly they said we're pivoting to jobs. And I think somebody finally actually got a hold of the data. Uh, so yeah, but, but the, the thing is they will try to, let's, let's face it, the government is sort of limited on what it can do, especially now since we've done every, you know, the Fed, I mean, so, so I mean in a sense, they, they have to give lip service to the idea and hope that the economy really does recover and just sort of keep a little, keep quiet on some of these other issues to save your, the people who are up in 2014. But I, I think they do watch, but sometimes it, and it, you don't, neither party now wants to recognize certain facts. 
you know, if facts are uncomfortable from what you're trying to do, then you don't want to recognize those facts. And so there will always be resistance to recognizing reality. I can't help but ask myself, do we get the government we deserve? How much of this is ultimately our fault? The one thing, um, if everybody voted, you couldn't have this. See, that's the one. Uh, I mean, I showed you that turnout slide where you have two out of 100 people actually voting. And there are colleagues, uh, Todd Mann and Norm Ornstein in their recent book, what's the title of the book? It's worse than you think. They call for mandatory voting. Uh, Marty Wattenberg at Irvine calls for mandatory voting. And that would probably put an end to this. The, the question I have, well, first of all, it never happen. I mean, you know, the Americans just won't go along with that. But we vote so often that it'd be almost you know, you know, involuntary servitude to require people to vote you know, primaries, bond issues, you know, on year, off year, municipal, et cetera. But the countries where they do this, they typically have like one or two votes every five years. They have a vote for parliament, maybe a vote for the European parliament. And so it's, it's easy enough to have that. Um, so, but yeah, it's because of the, the people who are most intense and almost by definition most extreme are the ones who dominate our politics. So you agree that elites have polarized, but not the mass public. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the mass public has not followed political elites? Why have they not, why have they not taken cues from uh, political leaders on issues and done a better job of maybe sorting this out of polarized? I think they, uh, adult Americans have a lot of common sense. They have a lot of street smarts. They know nobody has a you know, hotline to God and their, their policies are all right. You know, people sort of, they listen, they can tell when they're getting a, seeing a, an act. And I, so I think, um, I think it's simply that, that people just sort of, I, they're turned off to politics. It's trust, you know, I mean, we, the, 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 the way politicians conduct policy, politics, the squabbling, I mean, we raise our kids not to behave the way our political leaders behave. You know, they're like two-year-olds in a sandbox, you know, and we, in business, in academia, you don't behave that way. Adults don't behave that way. And I think, I think the population just, they're waiting for somebody, some better set of choices. Uh, join me now and thank you all for being up for a really interesting